I'm Kathy Wagonish, president of the Bennington branch of AAW. I welcome you to our discussion this evening, and I'd like to introduce you to one of our board members, Julie Mackeman, who will be your moderator. Good evening, and thank you. Let me start by saying thank you to, the, to our four guests tonight in our woman's journey into politics. Having people who are um, willing to run, to represent us in our government is so fundamental to, to our participatory document uh, democracy. Thank you to all of you for wanting to run and represent us and make our voices heard in our national capital. Uh, like Kathy said, just over a hundred years since women got, American women got the right to vote. We have come a long way. A record-breaking 145 women in the U.S. Congress, 24 of them in the Senate, with a tie-breaking vote given to a woman vice president, and 121, 121 in the in the House of Representatives. Now, um, for 46 of our 50 states have sent women to Washington, D.C. The outliers are Alaska, Mississippi, North Dakota, and Vermont. Now, Alaska, Mississippi, North Dakota, they have all sent women to the other side, the, the, not the House of Representatives, but to the Senate. Vermont alone, stands with a perfect record of never sending a woman to the U.S. Congress. Our record remains unblemished until maybe this year. This is beginning to feel like a historic moment when over a hundred years after American women got the right to vote, finally Vermont may be sending a woman to the, to the U.S. Congress. Um, when we first started planning this program some time ago, we focused right away on um, the House of Representatives, specifically because we were already seeing women declare their candidacies. Since then, over on the other side in the Senate, um, Christine Nolan has thrown her hat in the ring for the, the Senate, which for us kind of underscores and amplifies this sense of historic moment. And we are so glad for the opportunity to talk to the four women for the House of Representatives about what it's like to take part in this historic moment. And tonight is not a debate, it's a conversation. And when we extended an invitation to these four candidates to come and talk with us about being a woman in politics, we knew it was a big, a big ask. This is going to be a very competitive race. And these women, they, each one of them wants your vote and they're going, they're already working so hard to get it. Some of you will have, many of you will have tuned in last night to that their first debate sponsored by Vermont Digger. And we heard, we heard what, where, how their campaigns are shaping up. So for them to take a break from the campaign trail to talk not about issues, but about women in politics, is, is kind of a big deal. We thank you and appreciate it um, deeply, deeply. So um, uh, what we'll be doing tonight is, uh, um, new, this just in, we had advertised this uh, event is running until nine o'clock. We decided instead to move it back to 8.30. I think that'll give us plenty of time to have a good conversation. So um, we're planning now on um, running until, until 8.30. So it's a conversation and in my role as, um, as a, the facilitator of the conversation, I'm going to ask some prompt questions, just a handful of them, and we'll have a discussion around those questions. So I'll choose, for each of the questions, I'll choose the first person that I'm asking it to, but then I'll invite the others to join in the conversation so everybody gets a chance to, to contribute however they, they want to. And for the um, live audience that's watching this Zoom, if you have questions, please post them in the chat and towards the end of the program, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. And so we don't have a, a stopwatch. We don't have a buzzer. This is what we hope, hope will be a great conversation. 
Um, so this is a woman's journey into politics. It seemed to me what we might do to start the conversation is kind of go back to what I'll call the, the, the origin story by asking each of you one at a time to join me on the screen and introduce yourself with four things, four things. Your name, where you're Zooming in from tonight, your current political um, title or role, and then if you have it in you, could you share us a story about how you got into politics and specifically your first, your first campaign? When did, when did you first run for office? And um, knowing that a lot of people out in our audience, probably not many of them are professional politicians, but a lot of you in the audience have had the experience of running for a position, of having opponents and running. And I want to talk to you to just say it for a moment. It seems to me that um, in America, democracy isn't a game just for political professionals. In America, it's, it's a game for every man and every woman. So I thought that I might start myself as an everyman, a non-politician, as sort of the stand-in for the audience and introduce myself. My name is Julie Mackinnon. I'm zooming in from Pownall. I'm on the board of AAUW. I'm the secretary. My first campaign was when I was in junior high in a public school in the Midwest. I ran for treasurer of the student council. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure why, but I think I've been um, the, the student representative for my homeroom ever since I've been in the fourth grade, so I kind of knew what a student council was. So I ran for treasurer with a pretty simple campaign. It was handwritten magic marker signs that said things like, money is the root of all evil. Let Julie take over your guilt, Mackinnon for treasurer. Or that money burning a hole in your pocket? Give it over to Julie, asbestos pocket Mackaman, Mackaman for treasure. I was r running against a girl, a pretty girl, um, who I didn't know because we weren't in any um, of the same classes. But um, when I would try, when we were passing each other in the hallway, my attempts to say hello, to meet her, to wish her luck in, the, in our campaign for treasure, she snubbed me, looked right through me. I won the election, and my opponent never um, acknowledged it. That It's over um, half a century ago, so I'm not really expecting her to call. But for the record, she never said congratulations. Um, I'll conclude by saying here are three things I learned from my first campaign. One, back then, and that's a generation or two ago, boys ran for president and vice president. Girls ran for secretary or treasurer. Two. Your opponent may be a colleague, but isn't necessarily a friend. Three, student councils across America are such an important training ground for public service and introduction to politics and elections. Thank you for this every woman talking about her roots and how. Um, I'm going to, in a randomly selected order, ask you and it'll be one at a time just to introduce yourself however the way that i just did and this is randomly selected this is my husband at the breakfast table this morning drawing out of a hat first molly please join me and tell us who you are thank you so much thank you for that really wonderful um introduction and it's just really special to be here tonight i love that we're having a conversation i wanted to begin um, by thanking you, thanking AAUW. My understanding is that maybe some other branches also zooming in tonight. I think there's some viewers at the Northshire Bookstore. So welcome to all of you. Um, and just to recognize perhaps just a moment of joy that it's 2022, that there are four incredible women running for this office. And as was um, said to me today again and again and again, that we have um, an abundance of incredible candidates. So. It's special to be here. I'm glad we're gonna have this conversation. But to your question, um, my name is Molly Gray. I am zooming in from Burlington, Vermont, where I now live with uh, my husband, Mike, um, our second gentleman, Vermont's second gentleman. 
I currently serve as Vermont's 82nd Lieutenant Governor. And I'll be quite honest, uh, this is actually the first elected office that I've uh, ever run for. Um, I guess though my path to service started, um, I would say just after graduating from the University of Vermont. I worked for Congressman Welch in 2006 and helped elect him. Um, I worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, I clerked on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals after graduating from the University of Vermont. And um, I think, a, a, you know, we all have moments, you decide to talk about your origin story when you start thinking about well, what is my service? And I remember quite distinctly, I was working overseas, um, trying to promote human rights and start an international organization and arriving home in June of 2018. And in a two week period, uh, the United States left the United Nations Human Rights Council, left the Paris Climate Agreement, this was under President Trump, and de detaining kids along the US-Mexico border. And then at home in Newberry, looking around and seeing more lights off than lights on, and just having this moment, like we have really lost our way. Um, and then going on to serve as an assistant attorney general, uh, teaching law classes at night of uh, international um, human rights law classes at Vermont Law School. And I remember while serving as an assistant attorney general, uh, there was one moment, unfortunately, where my mom, who's struggled with multiple sclerosis since 1999 when she was diagnosed, got quite sick and she went into the hospital and uh, we weren't quite sure what was gonna happen and I remember I used up all my accrued vacation days at the time and then my sick days and I was trying to pay off my student loan debt. That's why I was teaching at night and renting an apartment in Burlington. I barely had enough money to do all of that. And I realized that I might have to leave my job in order to be able to care for my mom and kind of get through this really tough challenge for our family. Um, luckily she got better, but for me it was the moment that really, um, for me, helped me understand why paid family and medical leave is so deeply, deeply important. And I know now that Vermonters deal with these challenges every single day. Um, but later when we had an open lieutenant governor seat, uh, really deciding that we always have a choice. You know, can we, do we stay where we are? Do we step forward and serve? And for me, that was a moment of recognition of um, bringing together a lot of different experience uh, to try to focus on our demographic crisis as a state, and then really to try to address a lot of underlying issues so that the sandwich generation, um, especially the sandwich generation of women who are trying to take care of parents or thinking about starting a family, have the ability to do so. So it's an important issue for me, and it's um, the reason I, the core, one of the core reasons I ran for Lieutenant Governor, it's still something I care about today. But thank you for that <laughs> wonderful question, and I'm just so happy to be here. Thank you so much. And Lieutenant Governor, that's pretty good as far as it goes. It's not the treasurer of the Franklin Junior High Student Council, but if you need any tips in the course of your campaign, call me, call me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, next joining us, I'd like to ask Becca to come to the screen and tell us about yourself. Hey, Julie, I, I loved your story. There were so many parts of it that had me laughing out loud. So I am Becca Ballant. I represent Wyndham County, but I am zooming in from Montpelier tonight. And uh, interesting for many of you, I think uh, you would want to know that I live with uh, Supreme Court Justice Marilyn Scoglin. And she is one of um, the only Supreme Court justices in the country who ever read for the law and did not go to law school. And she was the very first um, justice to be seated who read for the law. And she's a longtime friend. And so I'm sitting uh, in, our, in our house here in Montpelier. So my very first election, much like you, was very young. It was uh, Westmere Elementary School. And it was Mrs. McMurray's first grade class. And like you, Julie, I cannot remember exactly the platform. I think it was about hall passes, something about hall passes. Uh, but I remember the slogan, which I had to get help writing because it was first grade. It was, balance got talent. And it was enough to win. And so uh, I served with the distinction, as I recall, um, and ran for uh, 
president of the student body in eighth grade, ran for president of the student body in 12th grade, served in both those capacities. And um, my first elected office here in Vermont was um, a little, if you want to nerd out, uh, Brattleboro is the only town meeting that is a representative town meeting. So not everybody gets to go. You have to run from your neighborhood. So my very first election was running to represent my neighborhood in um, the representative town meeting. And um, I have to say that I think in addition to not being encouraged as, as a woman to run for office, I certainly didn't have any um, role models, and we're talking about mentorship, um, as, a, as a, a gay kid. And in fact, you know, the only out gay politician I knew was Harvey Milk, and he had been assassinated. And so it's been uh, the joy of my life to be able to serve in this way uh, when, when I was a kid, I thought that would never, ever be a possibility for me. So um, thank you so much for pulling us here tonight. It's really a treat to talk about women in leadership and mentorship, and I look forward to this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it, it occurs to me when we extended the invitation, we realized this is the last thing that any of you want to be doing. Taking I'm a true. Break. I'm okay. true. Really, this is the fun part. This okay, is the oh, fun part. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Okay, next joining us, Keisha, please come on and tell us about you. Thanks so much, Julie. And um, I want to thank you. I want to thank the whole AAUW crew. And I want to mention Jackie Morrow, um, because although I don't see her in the list tonight, I believe she was part of the genesis for this, at least. I ran into her at the Bennington Museum Gala, and she was so excited to help make this happen. Um, so it's uh, an honor and privilege to be here. I just wanted to invoke her spirit as well. Um, so I am Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale. I live in Shelburne uh, with my husband and our dog Miso, um, and he's kind of downstairs in the kitchen doing something right now. My dog's running around, so I'll try to stay muted when I'm not speaking. Um, and I am proudly a Chittenden County State Senator. Um, and you know, Julie, I was listening to you talk about so many moments in history that are important. Um, you know, as you and others may know and appreciate, for a lot of women of color those landmark moments came far later in history. Um, and, you know, I'm proud, but also it should be of some concern to folks that I'm the first woman of color in history to serve in the state Senate. I was the first woman of color to cast a ballot in Vermont's electoral college. Um, I'm proud of these firsts, but, you know, I certainly don't want to be the last. Um, I just stood next to a picture of Luvenia Dorsey Bright today in the Vermont Historical Society, which I encourage people uh, to visit. And Luvenia Dorsey Bright was the first black woman to serve in the legislature in the 90s. Um, and when I got to the legislature in 2008, I was only the second woman of color to serve in the legislature. Um, that you know was, was openly identified as a woman of color. So um, we have a long way to go and we're doing better in terms of our representation in the state. Um, you know, but we, we want to get past these historic firsts and make sure we're welcoming as many women as possible into leadership roles. Um, my, first, uh, my first foray into electoral politics was fifth grade. I'm not trying to outdo anybody here. Um, when we, we had a fifth grade student council president and there were three boys running. And I had seen, I read a lot of books about, about women and people of color uh, who who fought and in some cases lost opportunity and lost their lives for my right to vote and my ability to participate. And so at that age, I took it very seriously um, that I should run because there were only three boys running and I won. Um, and I did take the role really seriously. I would go to the school board and write speeches on index cards to talk to them. And this was Los Angeles. So I was talking about gang violence and, you know, kids, kids who couldn't afford to eat and um, you know, things that were happening around our school that were unsafe and how kids were able to get to school or not. Um, and, you know, later when I became a legislator in Vermont at the age of 22, I went back to my elementary school to, to talk about my experience being student body president. And my mother came with and she wanted to stand in the back and just listen to me. She could get the time off of work. And that had been rare in our childhood. And I say that because 
when we were leaving and I had talked about student government and that early leadership, she said, I don't really know how to tell you this, but I didn't know you were student body president. Um, I was too busy working multiple jobs and taking care of three kids as a newly single mom. And I just had no idea that, that you were student body president. Um, and so I look back and I thought, well, I didn't feel abandoned. I didn't feel, you know, uh, unparented. So, you know, it reminded me that, that in, in that year and in my elementary school experience, you know, the Boys and Girls Club made sure that I had what I needed to be successful in school. The Parks and Rec staff li listened to my little speeches on the index cards. The, the, you know, teacher that advised the student government made sure that I knew what it meant to be a leader and how to, how to live out my passions. And the vice principal drove me to the school board meetings and then took me home and fed me dinner. Um, and so, you know, a lot of adults took care of me and I have not forgotten the importance of that as I try to pay it forward in the policy realm as well. And in fact, when I was elected to the legislature, one of the women on that school board was Julia Brownlee, who's now the congresswoman for that area. And when I was became a legislator, she wrote to me and she said, I just knew in fifth grade that you were going to run for office the second you could um, other office outside of student government. And, um, you know, that that always meant a lot to me. So it has been a long road, um, not an easy one, but there were a lot of adults who who stepped in to make sure that I felt supported and that I could be the person I am today. Thank you so much. You as a fifth grader walk circles around me in junior high as a treasurer. <laughs> and maybe that's, that's why some of us become an everyman and don't go into politics and others find a path to keep on going. Thank you so much. Thanks. And now finally, <laughs> finally, Shanae, join us and tell us who you are. Hi, I am so Hi. happy to be here for a number of reasons. Um, first of which, and I have you know the pleasure of going last, and I'm so excited to get to know the other candidates in this new and different way. I already feel like I, I know you much better, and and not in a way where we are like asking each other questions. But I am I'm really excited to be in this format to also build a little sisterhood too, and and get to know you. Um, you know, Julia, I'll be honest with you, as you've described yourself as an every person um, and not a career politician, I've that's resonated with me because that's my story too. Um, I have not held political office before, and you know, my title right now is is Vermonter, is is social worker, is daughter, sister, wife. Um, my last title was um, Congressman John Lewis Social Justice Fellow, serving in the office of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and so most articles refer to me as a congressional aide, former congressional aide, um, but uh, certainly am, am happy to be diving into this race and, and making my first foray into, well, I guess actually I'll pause because I thought about it and I was like, wait a second, I actually ran for secretary in either seventh or eighth grade at Essex Middle School uh, in, in where I'm, I'm calling in from is Essex. And um, I lost and I ran against a friend not on purpose. <laughs> we just happened to run against each other and it ruined our friendship. So I was like, I have nothing to do with politics anymore. This is just fundamentally not something I want to be a part of. Um, but certainly I've always had a passion for government. Um, and so I've always kind of held that duality and like, you know, maybe politics isn't the place for me, but certainly government. And that was from a very early age. Um, my, my parents met when my dad joined the Peace Corps. And he was assigned to Monrovia, Liberia, where he met my mom. And they met in in the mid 80s. I don't remember the exact dates, sorry, parents. Um, and my dad overstayed his assignment and got a job with the UN, was working, um, working in Monrovia with my mom. And in 1989, the Liberian War, a civil war started. So my mom and her entire family and my dad, and they were married at the time. Um, they had, been married in Liberia, they had to leave. Um, and my dad left first uh, because he was, you know, had American citizenship and he had to hustle to get my mom. And my, my mom had three boys when she was still a kid herself, my three brothers. And um, they needed to be safe immediately. Um, I don't know how much everyone knows about, I would like to keep joy and levity in this conversation, but the Liberian Civil War was incredibly um, traumatic and employed child soldiers. And it was, um, you know, a conflict that took 
over a quarter of a million lives and displaced nearly every Liberian. I think that's a stat I've seen, like at almost every Liberian had to leave their homes in some way, shape or form. So it was incredibly urgent. And so my dad at the time, a young guy had to figure out how to work in the government and how to get his wife and the kids that he so happily welcomed into his life and my mom's family safe. And we have, we still have the letters from then Senator Jim Jeffords, um, writing to embassies saying like, you know, you have to expedite these visas and writing letters to my mom saying, I hope, you know, when she finally did come to the United States that said, I hope you found peace. And I hope that your family are, you're able to heal from this moment. And seeing those letters as a, as a kid, it was so profound to me. Um, and so important because I saw that government has a real capacity to make our lives better. Um, and, you know, throughout, throughout my life and the course of history, we've seen that um, many times our government does not make that choice, does not step in and fully embody that capacity it has. But I've seen this, these sparks throughout my life of, of the support for, for families like mine. Um, and that was it always kind of sparked that interest in me. And I think maybe that's why seventh or eighth grade <laughs> or eighth grade Shanae wanted to, wanted to dive in. But um Politics is, has not been my route because I I, I found I, I wanted to find a way to really care for folks. And as a kid and as a young black woman in Vermont, didn't feel like politics was anything that served me or was something that actually served my community. And it wasn't until I got the opportunity to work for a black woman who took it to the mat in Congress that I learned this actually has the, it matters who's in charge. It matters who who is in politics, because that is where you are actually able to drive that capacity to help folks. So I suppose that's a, a you know there's many stops in an origin story. You know maybe like, like all these <laughs> all these superheroes getting a whole TV series of their origin story. So I guess I have multiple episodes in mind. Um, but that's that's somewhat of, of how I've gotten here, and I'm excited to be diving into a race with incredibly welcoming and kind candidates, um, and also be able to be in these types of conversations. And I'm excited for you all to get to know me too. Great, thank you. So um, I'm talking now to the technician. Can we bring all of the candidates on the screen now? Because I want to ask not another question. I just want to do a little follow-up conversation. Great. But, uh, let's see. We still need. Yeah, okay, well, good. I'll ask another, I want to get Keisha up here too. Okay, great. Um, I want to ask another question, but just a kind of a follow up in terms of origin stories and first elections. I think you've all answered the question of how you got from there to the, but if anyone has anything that they want to add, it seems like all of you had careers doing something else and have entered politics. And I think I have an answer from every one of you. If you want to take a second, and if anybody wants to add something of like a turning point, I'm going to call on you first, Beth, because I see your hand. But a turning point in which you knew you were going into politics. And Becca, what, what do you have? So I, I forgot to mention a couple things. One is that you may, and the folks watching may not realize that until my election in the Senate, uh, we had never had uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate who was a woman. And it took a very long time. And I went back when I was first sworn in as president pro tem to see the names of all the previous pro tems. And their names were like Ebenezer and Erastus. And, uh, you know, you could just imagine uh, women and also the first, you know, openly gay woman in the Senate, like what that meant to look at all of those names and realize like, I studied history, and so knowing, like, forevermore, there are going to be kids that come to the state house, and they're going to see my name listed there, and so that it's a really beautiful moment. But I taught history for a long time. I taught history and social studies, both uh, for middle school and also for community college, and it took me until my 40s to <laughs> feel like I actually could run for office, and, and the impetus was watching uh, one of my representatives um, not really represent us well. And I would come home and I'd read the paper and I would get so frustrated and my wife, you know, she'd say, okay, so when are you going to jump in? 
And I was like, that's not a good time. Our kids are so little. They were in preschool and kindergarten. And then and, uh, she said, run in the primary. You're not going to win because nobody wins the first time out. And it was a very hotly contested primary, ended up winning. And then we had to look at each other the next day and say, well, now what do we do about child care? Now do we, how do we make it work? And so, but, you know, the thing that I always think about when I walk into that building is all of the students that I, I taught in Vermont. I taught at, you know, four different public schools and community college. And I feel like their stories come in with me to the building all the time. So thank, thank, thank you for you letting so me much. add that. Yeah. And I like that, that, that when you started out the sort of reverse turning point of like retrospectively, the turning point of seeing your name on the, on the flag. Right? Anybody else have something they'd like to just let me know? Yeah. Yeah. Keisha. Thanks, Julie. Um, you know, it, this is a, a group that's centered around university women and I just can't um, say enough good things about my experience at the University of Vermont. Um, you know, after fifth grade, I took a real hiatus from elected office. I was much more of an activist and working on clean air issues and environmental justice. Um, when I was a sophomore in 2006, I was actually uh, the student who was invited on stage to help introduce then candidate for Congress, Peter Welch, and then candidate for Senate, Bernie Sanders, with this rock star senator from Illinois that they brought out to make sure there was a big draw for the event. They were all men on stage and somebody said, you know, we're at the university, we should have a woman speak. And I didn't have a fancy title. Um, I was just really loud and really involved on campus. And someone said, you know, she'd just be great because she's unafraid. Now, I can't say I was unafraid to be standing with some of our great orators behind me in both Vermont and national politics. Um, but, you know, I got up, I talked about climate change and student debt and all the things that young people needed to be at the table to help resolve. And when it came time for that rock star senator from Illinois to get up, you know, he talked about having a father from Kenya and a mother from Kansas. And I have a father from India and a mother from Illinois. And I thought, I didn't know there was a story like mine in mainstream politics in the U.S. Senate. And in the middle of all of that, he turned to Bernie and he said, you know what, Bernie, if you don't behave yourself, we're going to run Keisha for the Senate instead of you. And it was the first time anyone encouraged me to truly run for office. Um, and two years later, I became the youngest legislator in the country and he became the 44th president of the United States. So, you know, you just never know what can happen in college when you put yourself out there. I also um, became the student body president before running for the legislature and running for the legislature again was having a, a mentor like Governor Madeline Kunin say, you are qualified. You know, you teach preschool, you're the student body president, you already represent half the district, which is students. and. So you should run. And often women, it takes, you know, seven or more times for someone to ask them for them to run. And it took a, a president and a former governor and a lot more folks uh, for me to consider it. But I hope it doesn't take folks at that, at that profile uh, for everyone here to consider running and serving. Or maybe you already have not Thank you. Thank you. And just because you said that thing about being on the stage with, you know, these impressive people, that's kind of how I feel with being with you guys here on this screen. <laughs> you know, you are rock stars to me. I'm a little shy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and Shanae and, and Molly, anything that you'd like to add about Turning Point or move on to the next question? See, yeah, the floor is yours. Floor. Floor. It's, it's just, it's really nice. I'm like, we're just going to talk and this feels really good. And I was thinking about, um, I actually, I remember Senator Rom Hinsdale speaking at that event. And I will just share briefly. Um, I also went to the University of Vermont. I attended UVM on a ski scholarship. I had big dreams when I was in high school. I'm, I'm going to go to the Olympics. My dad was Olympian and I was like, I'm going to be a skier. I, I was like, that's my career. Um, and uh, proudly ski race for UVM, but then started working for Senator Leahy in 2005. I had, I had never bought a suit coat. I remember going to my first interview and sitting down in his office. And um, that summer when um, I was doing my internship, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, uh, came off the Supreme Court and Justice Rehnquist as well, Justice um, O'Connor and Justice Rehnquist. And I remember answering phones and the Iraq war, um, it was 2005. And so we had a lot of Vermonters deployed and really having, I think I loved um, what Shanae was saying about just 
having this connection to government and sort of realizing what government can do, and spe especially in terms of constituent services. But that got me really excited about the plan after college, which was like, I want to, I want to get involved. I want to take all this passion and energy and excitement for ski racing. And I think there's some um, similarities in some ways, and maybe the other candidates agree with me between training for a I don't know. I know Becca is a marathon runner training for a race and training for um, a campaign. But I guess to bring it full circle, I was there um, working for Congressman Welch, handing out stickers on the line of folks who were waiting to get into Ira Allen Chapel. And I remember at some point I had an old flip phone and, and um, one of um, then, you know, it was then uh, uh, President or Pro Tem Welch someone sent me a note saying, Molly, you've got to get back to Ireland Chapel. There isn't going to be a seat for you because the line was around the corner. And I remember um, Senator Ron Hinsdale's remarks and they were very inspiring. And it is, it's really special. I think what's special is that we can all be here today with different stories that actually um, intertwine in many different ways. I, I'll just offer a little bit of a different turning point. Um, I think in, in my, in my life, um, and I am someone who likes to cultivate joy and, um, I, most of my life, I was not as, I, I am a Vermonter through and through, but spent very little time on the ski slopes. Um, I actually spent most of my life, I was a cheerleader, believe it or not. I don't know if anyone in this group would believe that. Um, but I, yeah, I cheered up and I, all through, all through college actually, um, so anyway, I, I, I think of myself as a pretty jovial person, but I think actually a lot of my turning points have been fueled by absolute rage. Um, you know, I remember being in college and I went to a predominantly white institution in Boston. Um, and we had pretty regularly about once a year hate crime on campus. And in, in, in those moments, I, and I think that's, you know, it's been a series of these, like, how do I channel my rage constructively? I'm so mad that our institution isn't doing anything. So I'm going to join this group called Dialogues on Race and, and force our school to have these conversations. Uh, you know, I, right after undergrad, I worked in this, I worked for a non, a nonpartisan think tank. And I was so mad <laughs> about who they would invite to events because they wanted to be nonpartisan. So I was like, you know what? I got to I got to get out of here. I got to channel this into, into a field like social work where I actually can be able to be with people and not really put up with a lot of crap <laughs> that, that this world requires, um, and actually be in community with people, uh, you know, and leaving, <laughs> leaving the hill just so frustrated about how often I would have to advocate with with staffers about just basic inclusions and basic enforcement provisions and bills um, and talking to staffers who are like just take the enforcement out and it'll be an easier bill rage <laughs> and figuring out how there are still there are innumerable things to be mad about every day um, and thinking about how can I channel this constructively into something that's not only going to serve me and my spirit, but also serve my community and my world. Um, and so I think it's been a series of turning points and even just turning on the news and seeing horrendous stuff every day. Like, how do I channel this and drive it into something productive and something that can actually make our community stronger? Um, so not a cow. I hope that's not too much of a negative counter, but also I think we have these turning points every day in reacting to a world that is not built for people like us all the time and figuring out, okay, how do I channel my frustration with these systems into a way that we can all, we can all flourish together. Turning points, joy, rage, everything. Um, I'm actually really happy to just be having this conversation. I do have a handful of questions and for me, I don't really care if I ask them all or not. And we want to get to some audience questions if there are. But if you want to hear what the more of the questions are, then we'll keep our answers from this point forward to you know try to keep it just to a, a, a couple of minutes. So we'll we'll start making it making it through through my list. Um, <laughs> this has come up already too, but I just want to confront it directly. Mentorship. How is mentorship, whether giving or receiving, played a role in your political career? And this time, we're going to start with Keisha. Thanks, Julie. So um, I, I hope this doesn't seem like a sidestep to the question, but 
when I was in graduate school, um, it, the, there was a professor who had kind of coined the uh, idea that there's a difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Um, and I just appreciated this framing so much because it's, it's, uh, it helped me look back on who's really made a difference for me um, in some courageous ways. You know, when you're the first or only woman of color in a lot of settings, um, you sometimes feel like you are marginalized in conversations, uh, you know, as I, and, and um, you know, Shanae said this well last night talking about her hero, her shiro, Shirley Chisholm, um, you know, who always said, when you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Um, and so, you know, I bring so many folding chairs to conversations, but sponsorship is the idea that you're not just sort of saying to someone, oh, you must not know how this works and I'm going to make sure you know the ropes and how to find things and how to ask for help and how to live up to the best of your potential. They're the people when you're not in the room who are saying, that's a great role for Keisha. She should take a leadership role in that. Let's not forget her capacity and her talent. Um, and so often, you know, as Governor Kuna would say, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. So, um, you know, being able to have people who instead of you know talking about you, um, make sure that they are uplifting you and putting you in those rooms so that you can do what you do best. And so often, you know, it's been a mix of people of all you know gender backgrounds um, who have said, you know, I see a lot of talent and potential in you, and I'm going to make sure that you have a place to shine and do your work. Um, and that was a lot of my chairs and committees. Um, you know, I started in the legislature. When I was 22, I spent my entire 20s there, and it meant a lot. You know, for example, um, even Speaker Shap Smith saying, at when I was 25 years old, you should serve on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, one of the most powerful money committees in the legislature. I had just become a homeowner, so I understood paying property taxes. Um, but you know, I think back to when Governor Kunin um, was the first woman to chair the Appropriations Committee, and she writes in Living a Political Life. You know, I was so ready to take my historic moment as the first woman to chair the all important, um, you know, joint joint revenue committee that that does the fiscal forecast every quarter. And it was the first time that she was going to chair with all four money committee chairs present. And when she walked in the room, the men were already meeting and said, oh, hey, Madeline, we took your turn. And, you know, she had to go out of the room and compose herself, you know, and and still, you know, be part of the meeting, show up. To the next meeting finally probably got her turn but never forgot you know that 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 turn had been taken away from her and so you know knowing that that people fought for me to serve as you know a, a young woman on a money committee knowing that i was standing on her shoulders and the shoulders of women who came before who didn't have a sponsor who didn't have someone saying they they are talented and they are the right person for that role thank you um next and an, an amazing question I, and I think about this all the time and um, I think about I will answer the question um, directly about mentorship because I, there are so many that stand out in my mind but also I think more largely community and having folks that maybe weren't a mentor in that traditional sense of in hierarchical positions or older or, or whatever, but just having a community of folks to always be your 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 personal safety net has been so important. Um, so even if it's not those per, those people ahead who are you know lifting as they climb, it's the people who are right around you who are like maybe we don't know how to help you either, but girl, we got you. Um, so that is I'll I'll also add that plug there. But specifically in mentorship, I'm thinking about. One of the most beautiful people in my life, Tiffany Enos, I know she's not here, <laughs> but I'm going to say her name anyway, because um, I, I want to say her name. Um, I, as I just mentioned, I, after one of the many hate crimes on campus when I was an undergrad student, um, went to our multicultural center uh, and <laughs> like stormed in and I was like, what are we going to do? Um, and she was like, you're great. Like you should be facilitating these conversations. And she became a dear friend of mine. Um, and I remember calling her when I wanted to go back to grad school and I was like, Tiffany, I want to, I, I want to get my master's in social work. How do you like what this is? And this is what, like, this is what mentorship is for me. I'm like, I'm laying my life in front of you. Like how, like <laughs> how, um, 
And, and he was like, all right, let me know as soon as you hit send on your application and we're going to make it happen. And I did. And she set up this incredible grad assistant job for me that paid for my ability that, you know, me working was able to, to get my graduate education essentially for free. And the rest was um, through scholarship money. And that is not an opera. I, I'm not someone who would have been able to pay for graduate school at all, um, or probably had the credit to get more, more loans. Um, so that was an incredible, and, and, and that moment, just not asking anything from me, but just again, that I've got you, I see you and I've got you. And those types of moments have played such a pivotal role in my life and particularly navigating predominantly white spaces for essentially all of my life, having black women like Tiffany in my life that say like, again, I see you and I've got you has been the, is the only reason why I've done so much, so many of the things that I've been able to do in my life. So in tribute to Tiffany, I love you, Tiffany, wherever you are <laughs> right now, but also um, one of the many mentors who truly, truly, truly changed my life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, Becca. And, and we're also interested in hearing if you do mentoring, which I could ask in a, in a, in a follow-up, but to those who have mentored you, but do you do mentoring? I'm sorry. Becca. Oh, not at all. I, I was really loving listening to Shanae. Um, you know, I think what's really interesting to me about this conversation is I didn't actually have any mentors. And I, I didn't have people who... Uh, were watching out for me. I didn't have people who were helping me navigate. And I think that's uh, pretty common for a lot of gay people of my age. I was not somebody who um, had champions. And so it's one of the reasons, and it was really what, while listening to Shanae that I was thinking about, it's one of the reasons why it was so important for me to go into teaching to be a middle school teacher. Middle school is like such a like intense, awkward time. And that was really, I knew at 11 that I was gay. I knew that I was not um, accepted by my family. I knew that, you know, I had pretty openly homophobic teachers. And so like when you don't feel like your teachers, as Shania was saying, see you or value you, like you got to figure out another way to navigate. And so um, I hated middle school every moment I couldn't wait to get out of there. And so it was funny that I ended up as a middle school teacher, but I think it was because like, it was either purgatory for like all the horrible things that, that I had, had done, or it was this like coming full circle and saying, you didn't have that. Like, it's really important for you to do that for, for others. And so, you know, I didn't really have a mentor uh, until I, At a, at a, um, just about 14 or 15 years ago. And she was someone that was like, I instantly, and I know my internet is a little unstable, but I, in, I we instantly clicked and I said, and she was a, she was a musician and she was um, somebody in theater and she was visiting a mutual friend. And I said, so, you know, I feel like you're asking really good questions like, how do you do that? Like, you know, how, how, what is the training that you have? And she said, well, I went to this institute called the Coactive Training Institute, and I became a leadership coach. And it's really about asking the right questions of people at the right time. And I was so intrigued. And so um, she, she called me about a month later and said, hey, why don't I do like an hour long session with you? See what you think. And I was so moved by how much I learned about myself and like what I wanted to do in my life that I'd let go of so long ago that she like brought back up to the surface that I ended up going and becoming a certified leadership coach through that same program. And through this program, you can't become um, a coach in this theory, this line of work, unless you also continue to be mentored and coached by someone who also is in the program so that you are constantly honing your skills. And so, you know, I was thinking about how um, I use those skills all the time in terms of asking the right questions when I'm, when I'm in the state house. Um, but I was telling you before we, we logged on that I wrote an op-ed in 2017 about mentoring. 
and how I'd come to understand it in a different way because I hadn't had a mentor. And it was called uh, Give and Take, Reexamining Mentoring. And it was about how good mentoring, and it goes to some of what I think um, Senator uh, Ron Hinsdale was saying too, like I, I don't have that language for sponsorship, but I, I think it's really similar, which is good mentoring flows in both directions, right? That it isn't one person like imparting the wisdom. It isn't some wizened like guru telling you what you're supposed to do. It's about building this connection that acknowledges and uncovers and champions the power that you both bring into the relationship. And so um, I've been really um, explicit about building that give and take mentoring relationship with friends and colleagues in my life. And I still talk to my longtime mentor twice a month for an hour. And that's what keeps me focused on uh, being always being rooted in my values. Whatever it is that I'm doing, absolutely rooted in my values. And so my life opened up when I finally got a mentor. And I wouldn't be in the Senate. I wouldn't be in this role as pro tem. I wouldn't be running for Congress if that relationship hadn't helped me to get to that place. And so it's very, that's why I was so excited to come to this conversation and um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these things. I think they're really important. Thank you. Thank you. Molly, mentorship. I, uh, I'll carry on that thread for a moment. That it's just incredibly special and really important to have moments to um, talk about our mentors because they're extremely special people, right? And it's like it's it's almost a little bit emotional. Um, and uh, I guess I I have two amazing parents, and I feel so deeply lucky to have grown up on a farm close to the land, and they provide a lot of love and support, um, but not a particularly political family. Um, and I remember grad when I was graduating from UVM and trying to kind of figure out what was next. And I started working on Congress and Welch's. Well, he was, it was 2006. It was so the last time we had an open seat and when he was running. And um, there was a woman named Carolyn Dwyer who was hired to be his campaign manager. And I had never worked on a campaign. I didn't know much about campaigns. Um, and I was hired to be his scheduler. And I, and I sold myself, I was like, I know Vermont, I grew up on a farm, like I'm a hard worker. And there was no reason for her to give me a chance. There was no reason for her to hire me, but she did. And not only did she hire me, but she hired a woman named Jill Kerwinski, who today serves as Speaker of the House. Um, the one named Andrew Savage, who went on to work for Congress of Welch in Washington, now works for Lime Bikes, but hired Vermonters from all over the state. Um, and gave us all opportunities. And I think, you know, today she, Carolyn is still a mentor, but the beauty of mentorship, and I think this was mentioned earlier, is that it's friendship. It's those who um, see what you're capable of and um, uh, give you the support to be the best version of yourself. And so I, I will forever be uh, grateful to Carolyn for um, kind of helping me see what's possible. And then, um, Governor Kunin, who uh, ran for governor the year I was born, 1984, and served as Vermont's uh, second lieutenant governor before serving as Vermont's first governor. Um, but as we know, founder of Emerge, I think there, uh, there are so many women today who are running and who have run because of her. Um, I certainly feel that, but. When I decided to run for Lieutenant Governor as um, Molly Gray from Orange County, um, a lot of folks did not know who I was and a lot of people were scratching their heads and thinking, who is this woman, where did she come from? Um, but she was there and she said, you can do this. Um, she was a professor of mine when I was at UVM and my senior year when I was trying to figure out the what happens next. So I'll always be grateful to her for believing in me. But I think the most important thing about mentorship is that you also figure out how to pass that forward and how to mentor and both as um, an adjunct professor, just being in the classroom and trying to engage with students and trying to help them understand what's possible. We're dealing with a lot of um, global and national issues and giving them the support that I felt I um, really appreciated and had done well for. And then 
as Lieutenant Governor, I'll just share briefly, I was sworn in and Senator Ballant was there as well and Speaker Kerwinski, or Pro Tem Ballant, Speaker Kerwinski, um, in the State House the day after the insurrection. And it was a really, for me, I, it was a pretty frightening time. Um, and uh, I decided that I wanted to do something to try to make sure that young people felt connected to our state government um, and started a thing called Lieutenant Governor for a day and feel really proud that I've had hundreds of Vermont students into the state house virtually serving as Lieutenant Governor for a day. They're there when we gavel in the Senate and recognize them, but also just to feel a connection to government and um, some early stage of mentorship, which I hope for many of them will carry on and that if they decide to run for office, I'm their first call. So. Uh, yeah, thank you for giving us the opportunity to shower. The people have um, shown us so much with a little bit of love tonight. That's wonderful. I sometimes think of mentors as kind of that, that magic thing you have in your hip pocket where, what would my mentor, you fill in the name, what would my mentor do? Oh, yeah, that's what I'll do. You know, they keep on giving us advice even when they're not there. Again, um, we have some more questions. Um, if we speed up the answers a little bit, we'll be able to get through more, but for me, I'm just, I'm, I'm really enjoying it just as it is. So here's my next question, and let's see, this one is gonna go um, to Becca, and it is, um, because you're running for a national position as the first woman Vermont would be sending to Congress, do you have any thoughts about what a woman from Vermont might bring to the national dialogue? It's abstract questions, but if you, if you wanna take a crack at, I give it to you first, Becca, and then to the others. What, what do you bring? Such an interesting question, and I, you know, I have, um, I think, an interesting take on that, and I think it's because um, I can see the ways in which Vermont is a really special place, and I can also see the ways in which it also is not often what it aspires to be. And so I hold both things. And um, I think Vermont at its best is a community of, of neighbors that looks after each other. Uh, we certainly saw that during Hurricane Irene. I saw a lot of people, my, my hometown of Brattleboro was completely and totally flooded and, and people just like turned out to help each other out and help out small, business owners and there were towns in my county that were completely cut off because of the floodwaters. And so we can see Vermont at its best as, as these um, small connected communities. And so when we are at our best, I feel like we can be an incredible beacon for the nation. And we've done some really amazing work around uh, reproductive rights. We passed some of the most progressive legislation in the last few years and now also soon we'll be sending out to the voters um, an amendment to be ratified that will guarantee repro reproductive rights in the Constitution. That's amazing, right? Some of the most important work um, that I'll do in, in the Senate. And so at our best, we bring that to the, the political sphere and all of our, our experiences. But I, I don't want us to get so um, I'm not sure about to buy into the narrative we have about ourselves to such an extent that we don't continue to strive to be better. And so, you know, when I first moved to Vermont, I had dikes scratched into the side of my car and I had to have it repainted because I was embarrassed. I was a teacher. I was driving to school every day. And that was my welcome. And that is part of the Vermont experience for, for many people. I've lived here now for almost 25 years, and I love this place, I love it. But I also want us to be clear-eyed about the ways in which it doesn't serve everybody, it doesn't make room for everybody. And so whenever I feel like we get so wrapped up in our own story about ourselves, um, I remember my wife's from Wyoming, another uh, rural state, um, not very populated, and um, we were living out there for a little while when she was clerking for a judge, and I went to mail um, some things at the post office, and because we didn't have enough, you know, we didn't have enough room in the car to drive home with it, so I'm, you know, putting the package on there. And the guy at UPS 
looks at it and he says, huh, Vermont. You know, I forgot that was a state. And I think about that a lot, that our, our self-importance sometimes the best of us. But I also know that I hear from legislators across the country when we do something powerful, like reproductive rights, like voting rights, um, like really you know, taking on issues around you know, protecting trans people. That's when I hear from other legislators and say, no, no, no. You really are a beacon of hope, and we need you to keep doing these things. So, you know, to to your question, like, what will I bring? I hope I will bring both that love, that deep love of this place, and also the clear-eyed soberness that we still have work to do. And I want to be part of doing that work, not just for Vermont, but but for the nation. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, my question is sort of the, the ethos of Vermont, and I think we've all experienced that in different ways, as well as probably the ethos of being woman, to be you know frank about, our, about tonight. Sinead, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I'm really inspired um, by many of the things that Senator Mount shared. Um, and I, that's, it's, it's so real, you know, I, I say this often, um, you know, as, as a young person who grew up here, feeling like this isn't a place where I can build a life. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's, it was just really hard to be a young black woman in this state. And I did not think that this was a place that loved me as much as I loved it. Didn't feel like I was gonna be able to build a life here. Um, and within that, you know, and, I, and I've talked to other to other black women in our state about this and this these are not my words so i won't and don't uh don't attribute them to me but um it resonates with me that a lot of our young people have to make incredibly difficult goodbyes um because they they love it here they've loved how they were raised they love how they grew up but just feel like this isn't a place for them for a lot of different reasons and it's not just because of the racism that really truly exists in our state, but also, you know, lack of opportunity or, or feeling like there's a lack of opportunity or just feeling like, you know, like, uh, you know, there's always a part of that. I think in anyone's hometown, you want to leave your hometown, but, um, but also as I, as I've left, uh, you know, my, my husband is from the South shore of Massachusetts. We don't hold it against him. It's okay. But, um, but often when I, you know, when we were we were dating and meeting his friends, I'm like, no, Wait, no, 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 no. Which, which, today, which town? He's from Bridgewater. Okay, I got to picture it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's from Bridgewater, but he's like kind of on the, he's a little bit closer to Brockton, if that gives you, yeah. Um, so super thick accents. Like, I didn't know what his parents were saying for the first couple of months. <laughs> um, anyway. You know, and always having that pride of like, no, 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 I'm not from here. I'm from Vermont. And for me, what that always meant was I don't just do things to do things, right? Like we, this is so funny. So my mom is is what, you know, people would call a new American, I guess. And I'll try to keep my answer short because I want to hear all of your great, great questions. Um, and she she came to, uh, I think she was in her, she was in her mid thirties, mid to late thirties uh, when she came to America. So she still uh speaks in, in broken english sometimes and then sometimes uh you know she has a pretty thick accent but it's so brings so much joy to my heart when i hear her say I, i'm a vermonter and i do what i want her um it's it's like the best moment and that's and that's it right that's that's it um in in exploring going other places it's always like listen i'm from vermont i don't just do things to do things we we do what we want we do what we know feels right and we do what we know is in service to our neighbors um and, and to the point that's that's been made, it's about making sure that we really live that out. And and I think that's that's true of our nation. I think that's why politics and government is a fruitful endeavor. We don't always get it right. We more often than not sometimes don't get it right, but it's worth doing. And we have these beautifully lofty ideals that feel sometimes aspirational and it feels like, you know, these things we wanna do are pie in the sky, but they're worth doing. And I think that is, that is that experience of being in Vermont is knowing how phenomenal this place is, the beauty it captures, how wonderful, truly, unimaginably quirky and amazing that our communities are, but also wanting to make sure that we live up to that that reality. And anyway, so I think it's, I yeah, I very much, that very much resonates with me, um, what you shared, Senator Ballant, and 
and thinking about how, you know, we, we want to make sure that our young people feel like they can build lives here. And also, you know, other folks who see Vermont as a place that, you know, there's values there that resonate with me. I want to be able to build a life there too. And so bringing pieces of that to Washington, but also making sure that we uplift everybody to, to reach the, the loftiness of our ideals as well. And wait till we teach them about the six seasons we have. We have <laughs> winter, we have spring, we have summer and fall, but what about stick and mud? I, I was raised that we had three seasons. We have winter, mud <laughs> season, and construction season. <laughs> Those are my seasons. Great. Molly, any comments about what a Vermont woman could bring to the national capital and the national dialogue? Well, I think kind of brings us back to tonight and this year and this election, which is, um, we will there will be a trailblazer right it will there will be a first and that means an opportunity to maybe leave some of the bad habits that other um uh former leaders may have had or have and not them suggesting there's anything but we get to write a new chapter and we get to write the next chapter for um the next generation of women who are going to serve as senators and congresswomen and i think that's really exciting um, I think there's some things that are unique about our leadership on the national stage, um, be it um, on voting rights or reproductive rights, which I think the nation's looking to Vermont and can be a laboratory for pushing things forward. Um, but when I think about, just to bring it to foreign policy for a moment, be it with Senator Aiken, who is the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, I think you know, he was pretty prolific in saying, uh, declare victory and leave Vietnam, like declare victory and get out, right? And Senator Leahy, who serves on the Appropriations Committee as chair of the Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations, has had a huge hand in um, the work to ban landmines and Leahy law, making sure that uh, militaries globally don't receive any funding if they're committing human rights abuses, um, thinking about protecting civil liberties after 9-11, and I think at times, um, Vermont's sort of been the North Star on justice issues, on foreign policy issues. And that's something that I think we have to think about as we um, carry forward, certainly. But we're also kind of a quirky state and we've got a lot of different things going on and our political views are pretty, pretty diverse, right? Where else do you have a Republican governor, a uh, independent progressive, a senator, a Democratic senator, a Democratic lieutenant governor. I think we have a, a progressive auditor. We have pretty much all the parties represented and we still figure out a way to get along and do a lot of good. So I hope we can bring a much more of that to Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Keisha, do you have something you want to add? Yes, absolutely, Julian. Thanks. I mean, I've appreciated all the answers. Um, and I don't want to say women are obligated to do anything because we feel obligation all the time, um, you know, and we sort of, uh, you know, are never given a break. We have to do all the things, you know, and backwards and high heels. Um, but, you know, I personally feel that when um, given power, women should make space for others and help share that power um, and sort of create more opportunity for others to experience leadership. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, when, uh, I learned all the tricks and, you know, talked to Governor Keenan when I was 22 and running for the legislature, um, you know, I was one of those people who thought, wow, I hope there's, you know, a better way in the future. And it was a privilege to be one of, you know, four women sitting in Governor Keenan's living room, um, when she said, I've heard about, I, I visited this program, Emerge California. And I'd like to bring this to Vermont and you all are the ones to help me. And so, you know, knowing that two of my, my fellow uh, candidates went through a program that I was able to help found with Governor Kunin in Emerge Vermont certainly means a lot. Um, you know, today I again got to look at a portrait of Luvenia Dorsey Bright, um, you know, who became the first woman of color, the first black woman to serve in the legislature. I want to say that, you know, a couple of years ago now when um, Northfield Savings Bank Foundation was looking around at what can we do in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, um, they had a great woman in charge of their foundation board who said, we're not just going to use the money to talk and have a conversation amongst ourselves as a largely white foundation board. We're going to give the money to organizations 
that are um, doing good work to help people of color. And, you know, she called me and it was a very consequential 20 minute conversation where I helped steer her toward the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, um, Migrant Justice, and the NAACP chapters in the state. And we at the NAACP had long wanted to create a leadership program for people to run for office. Um, and, you know, Northfield Sims Bank Foundation was so great about saying, we have, we want you to do what people of color want to do with the money, especially as a group of women of color, mostly creating this program. Uh, and it was, you know, it's leadership. It, it, it helps people of all genders. Um, but we particularly created it knowing that so many black women had been harassed out of leadership roles in the local level. Um, we lost Kaya Morris in the legislature, only the second black woman to serve in the legislature. We lost other women of color from a number of select boards around the state because they felt that the pain and the pressure and the loss of their humanity was simply too much. And so when we created this program, it was my immense privilege to call Bill Bright, the, the son of Luvenia Dorsey Bright and say, Bill, your mother's legacy is not lost. You know, it's been 25 plus years since she served, um, but we're naming a leadership institute after her. Uh, and it was a cover article of the free press. People learned about her legacy and we were able to help people remember those who came before and those who created space for us. And so I feel obligated that when a woman is leading, you know, she has to turn around and think of who are the other women um, that need support. It's why I stood on the steps of the state house with teachers to fight for their pensions. It's why when we heard that unemployment was affecting 70 plus percent women were the ones on unemployment in the in the heart of the pandemic. I worked to create a dependent benefit for unemployed Vermonters and think about those most impacted. So often, you know, when given power as women, how are we turning around and helping other women self-actualize, support their families and take a leadership role? And that's what I've devoted my life's work to. Great, great. We only have about 10 minutes left. And my last question, um, uh, uh, we're not getting very much from the uh, from the audience, but I do. I guess I just want to exercise my prerogative to tell you what the last question would have been, because it's um, it's a tricky one, and I want the audience to think about this as I ask this question and like how they are thinking about the answer, and then if anybody has anything want to they want to say, it's a little bit personal and it could be you just don't even want to touch this one, but if you think you can give an answer in about a minute, minute and a half, two minutes, I'll let you. Can I try? Um, 90 seconds, everybody. 90, <laughs> 90, seconds. 90 seconds, thank you. Um, it seems like these are dangerous times to serve in the U.S. Congress. We think of January 6th, the insurrection, but even before that, the New York Times reported earlier this year that threats, threats against members of Congress jumped more than fourfold after Donald Trump took office. In 2016, the Capitol Police investigated about 900 threats. The following year, that number climbed to about 4,000. Um, to the degree that you're comfortable in answering, do you have any, how, how are you, do you have fears? Are you afraid of going to Congress? Or do you have any strategies to help you confront and over, or, overcome those fears? Hey, here's the things that need to go down. Tonight. What? This um, bag here is food that needs some, to uh, I'm sorry, somebody uh, unmute, unmute or yeah, mute, mute. Okay. I'm sorry. I guess that's a wrap. <laughs> I had to leave on this question, but on the other hand, it's something that we're all thinking about. And if anybody wants to have a 90 second um, chance at that, um, tell me. Yeah, Becca. So I just want to say um, yes, it is, um, I think horrifying what we saw at January 6th. Yes, we know that um, elected officials in, in Congress are receiving intimidation uh, and threats, but I just wanna make it clear, like even those of us serving in the legislature now are receiving those. So Senator Ron Hinsdale and I, uh, just about a week ago now, received threatening uh, emails. It was posted on a white nationalist website um, saying horrible things about her as a woman of color and someone of Jewish descent, me as a queer person of Jewish descent. So like these things happen, they're happening. I think that's the other piece of me wanting Vermonters to know we're not above it. It's happening now to your elected officials and it is the reason why 
Um, we have taken our home addresses and phone numbers off of our websites because it's become, uh, it's here. It's not just happening in DC. So I just wanted to make that clear. And we're in it because we care. We are in it because we need to stand up to this. Uh, but no, it's not comfortable, but we have to do it anyway. Thank you. Um, I, I would love to jump say, Sorry, go ahead, Julie. No, no, I was just, uh, thank you for that, Shanae. Um, I, I, I also want to say, you know, thank you for, for your service to our state, and I am sorry that that is happening to you. I know that doesn't make it not happen, but I'm sorry that that is happening to you. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I remember, I remember being in fifth grade at, uh, at Essex, Essex uh, Founders Memorial School and we watched Roots. Um, and, um, now as an adult who has, uh, clinical training and trauma, uh, there was no, there was no conversation before. It was like kids gather around, we're watching Roots and then it stopped. And then we were like, okay, we're moving on to snack time. Um, and I remember like, and that's not just the only moment, but that is a specific moment in which we watched black women be assaulted on, on TV and not being able to have a, a, a way to process that. Um, and in conversations with my mom about, um, experiences of women in her village with assaults and and what it looks like when you're when you don't live in the united states um and i share those things because um as as our as our legislators also know um it's not just something that happens to you when you enter into a political arena or you just go to congress um for unfortunately for groups who are are marginalized women people of color and particularly in our moment, black women are incredibly unsafe all the time. So I have never walked in a world where I feel like I am fully safe. Um, and that it, it's, and it's something that you, you live with and you become okay with and you manage your trauma around it. Um, but I don't have the luxury of being scared because if I was scared, I'd never leave the house and I wouldn't do anything. So it's, it's one of those, it's just one of those things. Um, that if and I'm wondering if, if we can if we can leave it at that. Yes, yes. It, I'm and, not and even so, going. Uh, right, right. Because we yes. only have a, a couple of minutes. But Molly, do you have something that you want to add? Yeah, I, I want to just want to just recognize the courage day in and day out it takes to decide to run for office. I mean, what legislators here tonight have faced, what Shanae has faced. I think there's always a question of, is this the moment when it's serious or is this just another email? And that's frightening, right? That's, and that, what does that do? It keeps us from doing our very, very best work. Um, I wanna share one very quick thing. And I suspect the other candidates have received this question as well. There isn't a day that goes by, a gathering of folks that goes by where there isn't the question of why would you wanna to go to Washington? Why would you wanna go there? And I'm thinking, my goodness, how can we not go there? We have to, um, come forward as the next generation of thoughtful, pragmatic, caring leaders who really care about democracy. And so uh, does that take courage? Absolutely. But I think we're all here because we care deeply about our state. And what I know is that regardless of what happens in August, we are all going to be serving together in some capacity moving forward. And I think we just have to remember that. And the more we can bring people into the process and create ownership and connectivity, to government in this democracy, um, hopefully we can get to a better place. But I think that's why we're all here. And yes, it does take some courage. Yeah, thank you. It's a sensitive, touchy question, but you're doing such a great job of answering it. Keisha, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to end on a helpful note with this question as well, <laughs> but I so resonate with what Molly just said. And I kept wondering, is it mostly women? Because I feel like sometimes it's prefaced with, you're such a nice, competent woman, you know, why would you want to go to Congress? And I'm like, do you want like sociopathic men there? <laughs> you know, like why, why, why are you asking us, you know, not to do this? Um, so it really, I, I have been thinking about the same thing because I think we are getting that question a lot. Um, I think it's a really powerful and relevant question because university women are changing the conversation on college campuses about sexual assault 
and about you know fear of walking around campus and taking a leadership role. And we're here talking about this because we know college can be an incredible time to find yourself as a leader. And you can't do that if you feel scared and shut down and silenced and that your university itself isn't helping you. So, you know, just power to, to women and folks across um, college campuses. I've been following this at UVM and it's a powerful question um, about when we stand up and how we stand up. Um, I also just want to invoke the, um, you know, the name of Firm Feather and the uh, and bring trans women into this conversation, because I will tell you, I did a lot of honk and waves right in the pandemic, like we could do nothing else at some point, but stand there and wave at people since we couldn't go door to door. And, I, you know, I thought there were a couple of times I said, I'll just go by myself. And I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm a woman of color standing here by myself. Is this OK? Felt fine. I did a honk and wave with Taylor Small, the representative from Winooski, um, who's, tr who's the first trans, openly trans woman in the legislature, and people turned around to shout things at her. I thought people were going to throw things out the window. Um, it was actually the only time I've ever felt unsafe doing a honk and wave. So I just want to recognize that, you know, e uh, there are times I feel scared and there are times, um, you know, that I feel um, I, I'm, I'm given courage by someone like Taylor Small, who's questioned every day in every way about her presence and her, her being. Um, and, you know, so I just wanted to end by saying, I am glad we're talking about it. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm glad, you know, S Senator Ballant brought up um, the experience we faced. There's, and, and you know, Molly and Sinead both said this, there's, the, there's always the question of, do I just stay silent about this one? You know, what, what do I do? And I remember when Kaya Morris was leaving the legislature and the governor said, but if you leave, that means they won. And I said, but because we were all silent, they had already won. You know, it can't be up to Kaya. It can't be up to us to keep saying we're, this is not okay. And so I'm, you know, hope all of you will join us when you see something happening, when you see an ugly cartoon or an ugly statement um, you know, I know we're all banding together and trying to make sure no one attacks our, uh, us as opponents, um, you know, because of our identity or uses tired tropes about women in politics. So, you know, we hope you all will join us in that. And then this is going to be an incredible and historic and uplifting race. Thank you. Well, it's about 8.30. I can't thank you all enough for your um, courage, your generosity, your goodwill, and your intelligence. This is just such a great cadre of candidates. Uh, I just feel like I have some more questions. I wish we could get together with the entire audience somewhere in me and continue to talk because you, um, you have such great perspective. Um, I'm going to let the candidates now um, disappear. We're going to put up the, the logos and the websites of the candidates' campaign. So the audience, if you want to follow up and get in touch with any of their campaigns, the information will be there. Yeah, there it is. And um, my parting words would just say, um, also, thank you for the AUW people who put this together. Keisha, I think, uh, was Keisha who mentioned Jackie Mar M M Morrow, who's, who's the first one who came up with this idea. And, but also Sheila M M Mulano and... Uh, and uh, Don Rodriguez and Julie Hope, who have been, you may not know it, but we're actually not used to doing this kind of Zoom technology, uh, but they, they really pulled it together. And of course, our wonderful president, Kathy Waganesh. Um, thank you, everybody. Good night.